this is what we have done so far. We have started with our Sentinel-2 level two data, applied these three filters on it. So we selected all images in 2019, less than 30% cloudy over this particular region. We have not yet seen the images. If I print this image, you'll see this list of images. There are 29 images. And you can see these are all images that we found, but we have not seen this. So let's see if we can visualize this data. Uh, to visualize, uh, you need to add the images to this map below. All the functions to work with this data, this map below, are in the map module. So let's look at the, the documentation. So if you can scroll down, there is this map module. This is called functions to work with this map. There's this function here called map.addLayers. It says adds a given Earth engine object to the map as a layer. This takes five different parameters. When you have functions which have got log these parameters, and if you read the docs, some of these parameters would be in italics. So you can see this visparams is in italics, name is in italics. That means they're optional. If you don't give it, a default value of that parameter will be used. Only one parameter is required, which is the object that you want to add to the map. So let's just use this and say map.addLayer. Again, this is camel case, filtered, and run this. Okay. Now, what you'll see is something on the map. We have this filter, which is an image collection of 29 images, and we add it to the map. Some of you expected to see a nice Sentinel-2 imagery over your city, but you don't see that. Like I see some black and white thing. It's not what I expected. Because when you add this multispectral image collection to the map, Earth Engine doesn't know how to visualize this. When you add something here, you will see the Layers tab. There's one layer here. So this is the layer that we added here. There's a Settings button next to it. I'm going to click the Settings button. And it says, I have visualized this image, bands 1, 2, and 3. Let's look at the, the documentation for this data. This is the data set description. By default, it has added the first three bands to the map. Human eyes and computers, both we can see only three channels of information at once. This one has you know, 13 spectral bands. So we need to specify which three bands we are interested in seeing. You can say, I want a red, green, and blue band, which is what our human eyes see. If you want to look at a true color composite of the image, we can say, I want a red, green, and blue uh, channels. So we'll say I want band four, band three, and band two, which are the three bands of information in this thing. So I can change it and say, uh, display band four, three, and two. And I can clear apply. So now it's displaying the red band in the red channel, green band in the green channel, blue band in the blue channel. Still no change. Okay, let's see why. So if I look at the any image, you can see the type of all bands, they are saved with this data type called int 16. So the pixel values of the bands are integers. So each pixel is an integer and they are stored in a data type which can store values from zero to two to the power 16. So you can store values from zero to 65,535. That's what you see here. If I click on this settings here, you'll see that there's a range of pixel values from 0 to 65,535. So that's the data type of this data. We don't really know what is the range of the values where the data is. The range of values, pixel values for Sentinel-2, because since they are reflectance values, they'll be between 0 to 0 0.3. Reflectance goes from 0 to 1. We want most of the values of reflectance between 0 to 0 0.3, uh, which will be 0 to 0 3,000. Because in Sentinel-2, again, you will see in the documentation, all the bands have the scale factor. That means the pixel values are to get the reflectance from the pixel value, you have to multiply to this. So if we expect the pixel values to be reflectances around 0.3, the raw pixel raw, uh, pixel values will be 0 to 3000. That's the normal range of this. So I'm going to change the value from here to 0 to 3000, apply this, and now you should see something that looks more like a satellite image. How did I know zero to 3000 is a good value? Well, once you work with the data set, you'll know what is the 
normal range of the data. If you don't know this and you say, I just want to visualize something, Earth Engine also provides you with some functions to find out what is the range of values here. So when you add a new data set, so I, I just go back and run this. When you have a new data set, you don't know what's a good range of values for this. You can come here and you can do, say I want to apply a 98 percentile stretch. That means find me values, uh, compute statistics of the pixel values, give me the value at 2% percentile and 98 percentile and show me what those values are. So it says in this region, the values are between 400 and 10,000, the 2% uh, to 98% values. And you get some something better. You can play around with this and say, I want a one standard deviation. Give me the min max, uh, give me the mean value, and then give me one standard deviation values around it. And this seems like a pretty nice visualization, right? So you can see it's close to what we know it's zero to 3,000. And now we have this nice visualization that we've created. Uh, by specifying the band combination that we want to see and the range of values that we want to see. Now, you might be, if you've used any desktop software to do this, you would have not done this before. You said, you know, why if I add this image to QGIS or RGS, it just appears nice. Why do I have to specify this min, max, and visualize parameters? Well, let me show you what happens in QGIS when we open this image. So let me just open QGIS and Let's say I have an image. I've loaded one image, and you can see it didn't appear black. I already see some data. So let me see what you just did when I added this image. If I open it up, it says again there are so many bands. It didn't know what to say, so it displayed. You know, this is just a three-band image. It's just, this band one is four, three, two, and you can see it has figured out what is the min-max parameters. How QGS uses this. 98 percentile stretch by default. So it went and found out the bottom 2% and the top 98 percentile value for each band and used that. Use any desktop software, the software does it for you automatically. In Earth Engine, if you want to do this, you can come and apply a stretch from here and find out what are those values here. Once you get used to the data set, you'll know what those values are and you'll be able to kind of just guess and use the right value for visualizations. Questions on visualization? <laughs> So you created this visualization and you said, I really like it. You send it to a colleague. They get the script, they run it. And what do they see? Well, they see black again, because all the visualization we created was in your browser. It's not in your code. So when you send your code to somebody, they can't create this. So what we want to do is we want to use the second parameter here in this map.diet layer. It says visparams the visualization parameters. You can define it in your code and use that so that your code is reproducible. So let's define this. They are defined as a dictionary. So we'll say my min value is zero, max value is 3000. I also want to say the list of bands I want to display. So I'll use band four, three, and two. And now I have a dictionary uh, that defines how we visualize this. Give that as a second parameter to this function. Now, when I run this, you'll see that all of uh, the parameters are applied and you will see this nice visualization of your data set. When you add this here, you can see the layer is called layer one, layer two, like this. If you want to give a nice name to it, you'll see this map.add layer has a third parameter called name of the layer. So I can just say, uh, and now my layer will be called filter connection. There's a question on how do I add a collection of images from a drive? You can't. In Earth Engine, if you want to add uh, images or shape files, you have to upload it to Earth Engine. So if you have a data in your drive, uh, you can download it and then create, upload it from here, upload GeoTip files into Earth Engine. Uh, each user gets 250 gigabytes of storage inside Earth Engine. So you can upload to your quota and then you can use it. We'll learn how to do uploads a little later on in the course. Uh, you are able to use uh, data from Google Cloud Storage. Google has a cloud service for Google Cloud Storage. If you upload your imagery there, there's a way to import them uh, directly. We'll link to the documentation uh, in the notes. So what are we looking at here? Can anybody tell me what are we looking at? If I zoom in here, I see something, but what does this pixel represent? 
what you're looking at is when you have 29 images, search engine adds all of this, but it's a 2D viewer, right? You can't see 3D data. You can only see one value. So what is displayed is the topmost pixel. You have a stack of images and you, what you are seeing on the map is the topmost pixel. All the other pixels are there, but what you're looking at is the topmost pixel. By default, all the images are sorted by the date. So the oldest image is at the bottom, the newest images at the top. So what you're looking at is the newest pixel from the stack that is available. And that's a mosaic. So if I inspect any pixel value here, if I inspect it here, what you'll see here is a mosaic. So it says this is the mosaic that's the topmost pixel as the value of this. But there are 29 images. So you have all the other images, but the top value is the the uh, the latest image that's there. So here again, this image is good, but you get it has got clouds. We filtered for less than 30%. This one is less than 30% clouds, but there are still clouds here. So how do we kind of see this? Uh, how do we get a cloud-free data? One of the problems with remote sensing is that the law of regions will are always cloudy. You will not find a single cloud-free image in many parts of the world. So if you want to work with cloud-free data, you need to do something uh, different. If you want to do change detection, you say, I want to compare what happened last week with this week. If there are clouds in one of the images, you cannot do it. Right? You cannot compare them because clouds mean there was no observation there. So one of the techniques that is used in remote sensing is called compositing. Compositing allows you to take multiple observations and find a statistical value that is representative of that particular time period. So let's say you are comparing one month against another month. So you want to compare January of 2019 with January of 2020. And you can say, I'll first find all images collected in January of 2019. Some of them will have clouds here. Some of them will have clouds at other places. But if I take those five observations and find the average value over that month, that's likely to be cloud-free because the clouds have very high values in reflectance. Cloud shadows have very low values. So if I take the middle value, it is likely to be a cloud-free. And that allows me to create a cloud-free composite and then I can compare those two images. This compositing technique is very computationally intensive. So if you try to do this locally, imagine you want to do a one-month composite. You have to download six images, each having you know five gigabyte, and you try to composite that, that's like a few hours of operations. Uh, so it was not used widely before Earth Engine became commonplace. In Earth Engine, because you have this computation power, you can do compositing very fast. So let's create a composite. Earth Engine provides you many compositing functions. We're going to use median as a compositing function. So at each pixel, you have 29 observations. We'll find the median value of that and we'll display that. So this will be the average value of the pixel throughout the year. And let's visualize this. So we'll visualize the composite, same with params. And I will say this is a composite. And what you'll see is now the, the median value of this region over 2019. And you can see it's cloud free because we have so many observations, the average value of that would be the cloud free. And now you have a cloud free composite of this region. You can now compare it with another year and you can do this. This happened in real time, right? If you try to do this in any other way, it takes few hours of processing to be able to do this. Uh, so now in Earth Engine, the way to work with the data is first, you figure out what time range is suitable for your analysis. If you're trying to detect water for, uh, or uh, you're trying to work with agriculture and say, I want to have a composite for a growth season or a harvest season. You can filter your collection to the start and end dates of the date range that makes sense for you and then create a composite. So you get a cloud-free data. It doesn't have to be a year, it can be a season, it can be a month, it can be you know two weeks, three weeks, whatever date range makes sense for your analysis. Your first step would be to find the images for that time range, uh, do a composite, so you have cloud-free data, and then you can do your analysis. Uh, there's a question uh, saying that my supervisor is an ecologist and find it difficult to convince why a median composite is an appropriate choice and not a percentile composite. Uh, so median, uh, that's a progress, by the way. So I think a few years back, I used to get questions like, well, my supervisor doesn't agree that composite itself is viable. You should use raw images. Now everybody's learned that composites are actually good and they have advantages. 
uh, we'll link to a paper in the notes which says uh, uh, scientifically that composites are actually much better product than individual images. They are representative of the region. But among the composite, why median? So median is the 50th percentile. So why would you, you can do different type of percentiles. We can do a 90th percentile composite or a 10 percent, 10 percentile composite. You can do that in Earth Engine. There is a function that's available to do this. If you're working a very cloudy region, uh, what will happen is, let's say you have uh, pixel values like this. Let's say I have five images in a very cloudy region. The pixel values look like this. So some pixel values 3000, another is 3100, and then there is 9000, 10,000, 8,000, right? What happened here is this three pixels are actually cloudy. Cloudy values are very high. So the actual values are there. If you do a median value, you will get 8,000. Median is sorted in ascending order and take the middle value. So that will still be cloudy. So if you're working a very cloudy region, you can actually do a 25 percentile composite. That in my experience works much better. So you can get the sort of values and take the 25th percentile value. And that usually is cloud free. We have a script that shows how to do 25 percentile composite. Like now let's link to that script in the notes. You can see how to do this. So again, you can use different style of composite. There is a um, but many different compositing functions available. For example, if you're working with say vegetation data and you want to have some uh, yield analysis, you might want to say, I want the max NDVI. So I have filtered to this one month range and I want a maximum composite. So you can do that as well. So, uh, but uh, for most uh, uh, purposes, median composite is a good start and it works quite well. Uh, also, why, why median, why not mean? Anybody has any idea? Uh, correct answer is yes, it's robust against outliers because our optical data will have cloud shadows and uh, clouds, right? So you'll have, if the actual pixel values were around 3000, and if there's a cloud shadow, the value might be like, you know, 500. So imagine you a pixel value like this. You take an you know, average of that, it is affected by all these large and small values, which are outliers. But the median value is more robust against this, where you have, you sort them, the cloud uh, shadows and clouds won't affect the the values. So the median is much better for optical data. When we work with SAR data, radar data, which is not affected by clouds, a mean is fine. If you're working with precipitation data, climate data, mean is uh, better. So you can get average temperature, average precipitation, and so on. But for optical data, median is much more robust. All right, let's do the exercise 4C.